You're listening to Tarazi Tuesdays with the Bible is Literature. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos, and you are listening to Tarazi Tuesdays with the Bible as Literature podcast. This week, Father Paul continues his discussion of Genesis chapter 3, highlighting the functional connection between Nahash and idolatry and concluding with a review of the Bible's critique of Plato. I am happy to introduce Father Paul on the Bible as Literature podcast, Tarazi Tuesdays. And then comes the attack. Who told you that you were naked? Notice again in the original, naked arom and the smooth, the subtle, the sneak, arum are practically the same words, the three exact letters. Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? Actually, this is the central statement of that story. It's not that you have eaten from the tree of the knowledge of the good and the evil. No, it is have you eaten the tree of which I commanded you not to eat. Remember the expression earlier in chapter 2. And he commanded him. It's a specific command. But earlier it was the voice of the teacher. Now it is the voice of the judge. And it is the same person because there is one shepherd. And the classic example I give to my students is that I'm the same person during the semester. And at the end of the semester, for them, I'm Father Paul or Professor Tarazi, you know. But during the semester, I'm the teacher. At the end of the semester, I'm the judge. But the judge of my students in conjunction with my teaching during the semester. The man said, and this is very classic, it is the woman that thou gavest to be with me. She gave me fruit of the tree and I ate. And I always tell the women, do not be impressed when the men put the blame on you. You should answer them by saying, I, the woman, corresponding to the man Ish, was not around when God commanded Ha'adam not to eat. So the command technically was never issued to the woman. It applies also to the woman, obviously, that no one is allowed to eat from that tree. But technically speaking, it is Ha'adam. And here we have the play at the beginning between the woman referring to her husband as Ish and suddenly the appearance of Ha'adam. A direct connection with chapter 2. The man said, The woman that thou gavest to be with me, and here we have also a play, the with is Imadi, not the regular Im, and Imadi is from the same root as Ahmad, which is the stand. And according to me, it is intentional because it reminds us of the naked to stand opposite. But ultimately, God gave the woman to the man because the man was unhappy with the other creatures. Remember what I said about the rib. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is it that you have done? The woman said, The serpent beguiled me and I ate. Very nice statement. Because very often people say, well, it is the opponents of Paul. Imagine the Galatians saying that it's the opponents of Paul that beguiled us and we fell. 
<laughs> but the main point is that you were not supposed to listen to them, to be beguiled. You should stick with the command of God. Now, to wrap up, I left it to the end on purpose because, again, if you know the original language, and in this case, all those who know Arabic will know that that same word, Nahash, is the expression of an omen, or as we say, a bad omen, bad news. In Arabic, you say your face is a face of Nahash, Nahs, not good. It is the same root that is found in the two columns in the temple. One of them is Nehushtan. So again, when you know the original, you realize it's already bad news. And Nahash, to give the entire picture, is also bronze, which before was the main component in the wars and the armies and the destruction. Now, is it all there? My answer, yes, because what we have there are words. And what we have is Nahash. <laughs> and that is intentional. Now, in Arabic, the serpent is not referred to as Nahash. We have a word which is very interesting. One of the words to which we refer to the serpent is Hayat, which precisely it is Hayat Hasadeh. It's a living animal entity. So on purpose, when I need, I bring in the Arabic to remind my hearers that even the other Semitic languages do not help you 100%. Because as I stressed in my book, this language was created as such on the basis of Aramaic, but with the use of other Semitic languages to make it what we should call the scriptural language, not the Hebrew language, refer to my book. So today the presentation was more technical, possibly less exciting, but I hope that my hearers will realize that we should move from excitement to the text. My excitement about the text should not be equalized with the text itself. I remember students who were all tell me the liturgy is to be experienced. I mean, Schmemann and I agreed all the time, and people said that. No, it's not experienced. It's a text you have to hear. And if you don't know the original Greek of St. Basil liturgy, then you don't know what you're talking about. But that seeped all over the place. And again, you know, we have to mention the Orthodox because we are Orthodox and we have to be self-critical. How often do we hear the word experience? No, you don't experience sin. You realize that you have sinned against a commandment and then already you are put to shame. It's not that they felt that they have sinned. You don't experience. And Matthew will push this to the extreme when he shows you that even the thought in you of wanting to destroy another person is already a fact, and you are responsible for it. Now, you could say it was just a passing thought and really, no, there is no really and not really. It is the scriptural text. That is our reference as it stands and hence the importance of it as literature. Literature means what I try to do today, showing you how the words are interconnected with the preceding chapter and also opening the door for the following books of the Bible. 
knowledge and command and so on and so forth. So this is what happens in this passage. And immediately after that, you will notice we move quickly to the judgment. So this mention of God being in the position of judging a shepherd, judging the sheep. But the judgment is there. We notice immediately in verse 14, which we shall discuss next time, the Lord said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you. And then he moves to the curse of the ground because of the man. We can call it also curse, but we'll discuss this, the punishment of woman. So the voice is already the voice of the shepherd who is seated on his throne of judgment as in Psalms 80 and 82. You were talking about Nahash and how it connects to symbols of idolatry or the idolatry of the temple of bronze and so forth. But then I noticed that the phrase in verse 13, the serpent deceived, the word for deceived is nasha. Now, when you hear it in Hebrew, obviously, it sounds beautiful because of the similarity of the words. I know that it's a different root. Are there connections for the word deceived in Hebrew, nasha? Two letters are the same, but nahash and nasha, where the last letter is in aleph, is different. But the choice, as you pointed out, may be on purpose, because one could have used another verb, is to stress to the ear of the hearer that ultimately the serpent is the deceiver. I would not object to that, but it's very important to understand that it is a link through letters, and actually this we find and I discussed this at one point with Richard, where yashab and shub, here again, the verb shub means to return, and yashab means to dwell. In some of their conjugated form, they sound the same, due to the fact that the noon is a weak consonant that disappears, and so on. Hosea, according to me, plays on that. So your point is well taken, but one has to be very careful not to say, well, it's the same root. Like Shub and Yashab are not the same root, but they have two consonants where the conjugation allows these two verbs to sound the same. Knowing good and evil in verse 5 sends a lot of philosophers off to their typewriters, writing madly and furiously about the nature of good and evil, and what does the human being know about good and evil? Could you help us pin down a little bit these terms, good and evil, so that the listener doesn't go off too far in imagining what they mean? Uh, well, uh, I wanted to avoid this because I discussed it in my book, but you tickled me now. I am convinced, and you can read my book on that, that the serpent is Plato. The text is an attack against Greek philosophy. Remember, my thesis says that The scripture was written not only against the Iliad and the Odyssey, but much more against the Greek philosophy. Remember Aristotle, who was the master of ethics and so on, was the teacher of Alexander. So let's go a little bit since you asked me the question (laughs) and I deal with it in my book. I believe that is 
the intention, and I'll explain it to you, but already I want to say that Paul does the same in his letter to the Corinthians very clearly. The whole issue of belittling the wisdom of the human being and the Hellenes in the wisdom literature is right there. Ultimately, you need the knowledge that comes from the wisdom of God. Now, let me go more in detail here. You could hear clearly that the Nahash here follows the method of which the people speak so highly, the Socratic method. I'm talking about Socrates in the dialogues of Plato. Okay. Where he teaches you what he wants to teach you by giving you the impression that you are getting to the result yourself. I mean, this is classic. But I make fun of that because the people say, oh, this is great. It gives us the freedom to interact. It's like this big fallacy of classes as seminars. Yeah, but the teacher ultimately is the leader of the seminar. Even if suddenly you find something because he led you and so on, ultimately he is allowing you to assume that you are doing the work and you are arriving to a result. And with this, I move to my open critique and criticism of theology, which followed the path of Greek philosophy. I mean, if by now we don't see that, I mean, <laughs> I don't know what to say. So it is precisely the method. God said, but did he say, in a, and then you go into a direction which ultimately leads you to a conclusion or to opposition which was the original intention of the Nahash. I'm convinced of that. Now, whatever the hearers want to do with it, it's <laughs> their call. I'm convinced that the attack is on Plato, which is the representative, if you like, of Greek philosophy. Scripture says no, and Paul refers to that when he said that you may have many teachers, but you have one father. Father means that begets you. In other words, you are not without the father, period. You remember how much I criticize so-called Miss Susie, the teacher of young children, especially the girls who would come and say, well, Miss Susie is really so nice. She understands me and feels with me much more than my mother. I mean, you know that. <laughs> we all know how the tradition, Judeo-Christian in its totality, is influenced by Greek philosophy. But the text comes from a different perspective of the Syrian desert, where only the voice of the shepherd is valid in matter of knowledge of what is going on around us. As I said in my book, you know, there are no reason endowed sheep, as you hear in our text, especially on baptism. The sheep has no reason. The sheep just says, ah, that's all. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network.